So today's topic is, so we've got a little topic that we're going to focus in on, but of course, please feel free to ask your questions on whatever you want. But the topic to get us started is, we're going to take a deep dive into how the C word has impacted on this sector. How have museums and cultural institutions responded to crisis and how have they supported the creative community to keep working? And our panellists that are with us today are Tamsin Russell, who's the Workforce Development Officer from the Museums Association, Natalia Palombo, who is the Managing Director at Deveron Projects, and Dr. Karen Buchanan, who's the Curator at the Gerloch Museum. So before we get started, I'm going to ask each of our panellists to say a little bit about who they are, where they come from and what they do. So we'll start with you, Tamsin. Hi, thank you very much. So my name is Tamsin Russell, I work at the Museums Association and I'm based in Scotland. So I'm waving from reasonably sunny Fife. Uh, I've worked in the museum sector for 20 years in a variety of different organisations from National Museum Scotland, Historic Environment Scotland, National Trust for Scotland, Science Museum Group. And I'm now at the Museums Association, which is the UK wide professional body for people that work in and with museums in the broadest sense, so collections based institutions. My remit is workforce, so I specifically am focused on workforce ethics, conditions, formal professional development programmes and a whole raft of other things. And certainly uh, how uh, my role has developed over the last 12 months has, has been really interesting professionally in terms of supporting the sector. So I look forward to talking about that later on. Thank you, Tamsin. Natalia? Hi everybody, my name is Natalia Palombo. I'm the director at Devron Projects um, and I'm based up in the Northeast in Huntley, Aberdeenshire at the moment. Um, and Devon Projects is an arts organisation based up here. Um, we, um, we work primarily across history, context and identity and we work very closely with our community here um, in Huntley um, as well as a global community. I've quite recently taken up this role as director at Devon Projects. Um, so just as a way of a bit of background, I developed and uh, directed an arts organisation in Glasgow before now for the last five years um, called Many Studios and curated an international arts programme based in the building called the Gallo Gate. Um, so in yeah, my roles, I've kind of worked always across two um, sort of interlinking areas, which is across the business and um, curatorially um, in creative organisations. Um, so overseeing the, the, the organisation itself and fundraising um, and staffing um, and also curating really exciting international programmes. Brilliant. Thank you, Natalia. And um, Dr. Buchanan. You're on mute, Karen. Sorry, it was very unprofessional. The most heard phrase of 2020. <laughs> Thanks very much for, for inviting me to the panel today. I am Karen, I'm curator at Gerloch Museum up in the uh, northwest of, of Scotland in the Highlands in Westeros. And I've been curator here for the last seven years. Before I came here, I was actually uh, an academic, a university lecturer in Glasgow at Strathclyde University. I then uh, did a master's in information management and preservation at Glasgow University, which got me into my museums and archives career. Since I've been at Gerloch Museum, we were, when I arrived in, in this rose, or well, at the beginning, I suppose, of a massive redevelopment project. So that has really been um, what has consumed my, uh, my work hours for the last seven years or so. We opened our new museum in July 2019. And in October of 2020, it was announced that we were museum, a winner of Museum of the Year, the Art Fund Museum of the Year 2020. So that's uh, a major career goal to date, I would say, tempered, of course, by the fact that we have been pretty much shut since March uh, 2020. Yeah, so looking forward to opening again. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody, for those introductions. So as we said, the topic is about um, how, how, how the sector has responded to crisis. So I wonder if I could maybe start with you, Tamsin, as an overview. And <laughs> you 
conversations. So what what's it, what have you been hearing from your members of what's it been like and how has the dreaded C word impacted on um, the, the sector over the last year? So, I mean, nothing more than you might have expected. So in, in terms of certainly from a workforce perspective, people have felt as if they're working in an increasing sense of uncertainty around either the projects they were working on or the communities they were working with, but increasingly also from their, their own positions in terms of their, their jobs and livelihoods. So uncertainty has been a, a common theme in terms of our members' experience. And certainly from, from, from my perspective, working with the Museums Association, the role that I take is around how can we support those museum professionals to enable them to still continue to do the fantastic work that they do. So uh, the work that I've been doing around supporting those is anything from sort of hosting a, a supportive space. We've got two Facebook groups that enable people who have and students are able to apply and, and, um, and join. Uh, uh, where, where there, there are opportunities to either work or get work experience or volunteer in the sector have been compromised. And that's really had a huge impact on their personal, but also professional identity. And I think that's a really important thing for our sector, that which is rather different from other sectors, is that our personal and professional identities are so intertwined that with, with those potentially being up in the air, that has an additional impact. On, on, on our ability to, to navigate everything that's gone on over the last 12 months. So that's one of the particular sort of areas that, that I've been focusing on, which is about supporting those individuals, um, providing resources, for example, about how to have, um, uh, how to, to manage your emotions, creating resources if you're a line manager, about how do you support your teams? Because unless we support ourselves, um, then we're not able to do and continue that really good work that, that we're, we're paid to do on behalf of our collections and communities. You're on mute, Anne. I had a barking dog. <laughs> um, can I bring that to you, Karen? Because um, actually, as as a member, um, you know, so as an individual working in a in, in a particular museum and with particular collections, what's it been like for you at the Gerlock Museum over the last year? Well, I think I've been quite lucky. Um, personally, I was for a lot for a while, which was very strange. Um, you know, having worked for so many years and, and as Thompson said, having uh, also as an academic, uh, as well as a museum curator, your professional, personal lives so so intertwined. Um, I, I think Thompson has done a brilliant job um, and, uh, you know, I, I tapped into the MA sort of social media and all the resources that she was posting while I was on furlough and it was just nice to have that connection to other professionals as well. Luckily, I was only furloughed for about nine weeks, I think. And then we did reopen for a while last summer. We were pretty busy. Um, I think you probably saw on the news that everyone was flocking to the Highlands of Scotland last year because there was nowhere else to go. Um, so we did have quite a busy summer. And then we had the Museum of the Year announcement in October, which gave us a boost as well. So I've been back at work since July. I am lucky enough to be able to come into the building every day because I'm the only person here and I, you know, I, I can walk to work. Um, but what is obviously very strange is to just being here on my own all the time. And we have a lot of volunteers that work in the museum here. And I, I do really feel like, you know, we're, we're losing touch with those volunteers. In fact, I've got a pile of letters sitting on my desk here that I'm gonna hand deliver that we've just written to our volunteers just to, to make sure that we are keeping that connection. So yeah, it's the, the, the lack of connection with our volunteers, the physical connection and with the community has been very strange. Yeah. And that kind of really comes to this next question, which I'll maybe come to you, Natalia, for this, for, for, for your insight. And it's obviously what you've just described, Karen, is what people are experiencing. And I've been hearing that a lot from students. You know, I can't get out, I can't physically get out to get the experience to be able to apply for the entry level jobs or the museum studies postgrad. So this question is, can you please recommend ways to build practical experience in the absence of traditional work experience opportunities? So I'll come to you first, Natalia, and then I think I'll take a little bit of comment from both Tams and Karen as well. 
Sure. Um, I mean, this is quite an interesting point for us. So Devon Projects, we um, we've also run an internship program, which has been, um, you know, widely regarded as, you know, a very positive program. It's resulted in lots of really great jobs um, for young people based in the northeast in the creative sector. Um, we are we have two interns here just now um, who have been with us um, for for a few months um, and I guess there's yeah there's a line here I suppose there's a line in terms of um, um, I guess this idea of temporary and what temporary working is and what is kind of more long term and integrated into an organisation and. As an organization, we are working at distance and that's that's a challenge just generally that I've had to work through with the team in terms of morale and um, health, good mental health. And that's been a big challenge. Um, but based kind of more widely in the time, we are able to work at home at distance and still support um, an, in you know, an internship program. That said, where the complications are kind of more around um, movement um, and that kind of comes into our programming a lot because we work internationally predominantly. Um, so we have, for example, an intern starting today who is not able to come to Scotland, of course, because it's um, because it's this uh, particular internship has started during the lockdown. Um, so, yeah, we've been finding ways to work digitally, um, you know, but as a team and also with new interns um, and we are still responding it's, and I mean I feel as if a year later we're still responding to the challenges as opposed to being proactive and that's the reality <laughs> for a lot of arts organizations who are adapting um, but yeah we've I mean we've seen some really positive outcomes um, but it's important to I mean that element of working with young people primarily um, is really important for our organization and really important for the community. So we continue to find ways to do that. Thanks, Natalia. Tamsin, um, I wonder if you could recommend some ways that students could continue to build their mm. experience in the absence of traditional. Yeah, um, I mean, I think first of all, the, the one thing is everyone is in the same boat. So you're not unique in this situation. A whole cohort of students, if not more, are all gonna be affected by the current situation. I think the second thing for me would be to be really clear around what that practical experience is based on your wants and interests of your future career. So think about your professional development purposefully rather than a scattergun approach. Equally within that, you might want to be opportunistic if there aren't that many opportunities out there, but thinking about purposeful professional development. I think there's something around the fact that we can be developing knowledge and knowledge can be seen in two different halves. There's theoretical knowledge that we might get through academic study, but there is more practical knowledge that we can develop through looking at, for example, case studies, standard operating procedures, toolkits, guidance, virtual tours, conversations. So there are loads of ways, five ways, that you're still increasing your knowledge at distance, but in a far more practical and pragmatic way. Add that to a sort of reflective practice around any experiences you've ever had when you have been in situ in an organisation just enables you to have a much richer, richer experience. Three final things. Volunteering still is an option. So we are seeing an increase in organisations adopting remote and digital volunteering. That is still hands-on experience, even though you may not be in situ or in an organisation. And then finally, just reminding ourselves, this is a long game. So if there are 22-year-olds in the audience here, you will be working until you're 70. OK, so you've got lots of time to gather that experience because you'll be working until that point. So there's something around just thinking about the fact that this is a long game and, and to pace yourself. Fab advice. Thank you, Tamsin. So, Karen, anything to add to that? Just to back out what Tamsin has been saying, we I think actually for us, um, some opportunities have been opened up. So whereas we had historically largely worked with local volunteers manning the desk and doing uh, jobs in the archive um, I had made approaches for example to universities before I'm used to working with universities but we've never been a popular choice I think because we're just so far away perhaps students don't know about us and um, they don't know how great we are and 
we're far, far away from their friends and family, et cetera. Now I am in a position where I have got student groups approaching us to do the work remotely because they can do it from where they are. So I've just set up a project with the um, computing science department at Strathclyde University, which is gonna open up a part of our archive, digitize it, um, create, create much greater accessibility. And uh, I've got one or two other things going on like that as well, which is usually exciting for us and I hope will continue. And I think that's really interesting and I've been hearing that in all the conversations I've been having today about the pivot into digital and about, you know, where there actually are opportunities and, and you can see that really starting to come through. Um, there's one other thing that I would maybe add. There's a really good free um, resource called Future Learn where you can do little courses on almost anything. So that's another good wee tool to be using to build up knowledge about particular things. So thank you very much, everybody, for your comments on that. So the next question, um, good afternoon. Thank you very much for today's session, my pleasure. What would you be looking for in 2021 graduates in the heritage industry as future job seekers and what type of roles do you think will be available in late 21 beginning of 22 so I think this is building Karen what you've been talking about about these programs that you're putting in place um, that are allowing people to move digitally is there going to be more of that is that where the sector is going to go um, if you're asking me I, I think Karen. that uh, we would definitely be aspiring to be delivering our outreach and engagement in a range of different ways. And at the moment, we have uh, funding from Art Fund and Museums Gallery Scotland. We've got a, uh, a freelance um, coordinator who's working for us a couple of days a week, helping us to do that just for 12 months. And that is certainly something that we would like to be, um, a post that we'd like to be financing into the future as well, yeah. Um, Tamsin, anything to add? I mean, I think there's just something that the shift to digital roles is really, really clear. So whilst we have seen recruitment slow down, um, we're still seeing new roles come up where organisations pivot into digital. And so there is something about thinking about your own digital competence. You know, so what does that look like in its broadest sense? You know, what tech, tech platforms are you used to working with? Is it about... Um, podcasting is it about filming is it about facilitating in a zoom space there are so many different uh, aspects of digital engagement across audiences collections and experiences so anything you can be gathering social media engagement all of those sort of things are all skill sets that will be required regardless of the discipline within the sector because everyone's going to have to rethink about how they get their messages and their content across so that's a really important part and if you can be accruing any of those skills now you're going to be in a much stronger position when when those jobs continue to come up and when you're looking for work natalia what say you I think, yeah, I mean, there's there's obviously a lot of really great opportunities in, in digital work and in this idea of pivot, but I think it's also really important to not overlook the importance of community. And I think, I mean, this is obviously quite particular to a rural context, but I think where we've seen really interesting shifts, in fact, is, um, I guess, as an arts organisation in a town, we've been particularly connected to a community, but I've seen this even from other organisations that I've worked with before, um, is is that your, your audience is now local, that is your audience. And, and as an organization in Huntley, for example, where we were kind of most needed was, for example, providing resources around food. Um, and we, yeah, I guess we've become closer to the community and what, in terms of what we're looking for in the future is, is not necessarily gonna be in digital skills um, or digital capacity for working, but rather in, in, in how to work with communities and, and you know, particularly in rural areas in Scotland. Um, so yeah, I guess different organizations will be looking for different things or working in different contexts. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And some of the questions that I'm looking at here is kind of about, will there be more um, remote positions? What will it look like? But I think there's no one response. It's like depending on the geographical area, the type of institution, you know, they might develop in different ways into this new working model. 
So there's one here. Um, what would you say is a typical entry level job into museums and cultural institutions, especially if you have an aim for curation? Tamsin? Um, so, first of all, I think often people uh, do a postgraduate course or an undergraduate course and their sites are set on curation because that's what we're most focused on the narrative. If you went into a pub and said, oh, I work in museums, the response would be, oh, you curator. So first of all, I would say it's great to have your eyes set, but please don't close all those other doors. And that's why I think it's really helpful to, to get a, a role in any, in any collections-based institution on any basis, because that refines your thinking, it develops your network, it enables you to make connections between what working with collections is and what working with audiences is. And, and um, once you're in an organization, you can capitalize on that context and the relationships you have by asking, you know, can you, even if you're if you're in a learning role, for example, or if you're working, you know, in, at the admissions desk, to, to actually begin to see what the reality base is. You know, often the, the perception of curatorial work is very different from the reality of curatorial work. So to, to get a sense about that. And I, I just think, you know, what do we mean by entry level? Uh, so that might be your first job within the sector. Uh, if you're being very pragmatic, it's about thinking about those volume roles. So what roles are you going to see where there are going to be more of them than any other? And that will be front of house. That will be where there are projects, uh, collections assistance. If there's a recant or a capital build, or there might be learning posts. So in larger organisations, you may well find that whilst your, your focus is on curatorial, there may be more roles available in other areas of the museum workforce that mean that your probability of being successful is increased. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> there's a few questions sitting here now about um, internships. Where can I find things? What's that going to look like? So I wonder if each of you could maybe say a little bit about practical resources, particular websites, particular places that people should be looking. Um, so I'll start with I'll start with you again, Tamsin, and I'll just come 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 round to Natalia and then to Karen. So at Leicester Museum's job desk is the, is the really go-to place. So both nationally and internationally, uh, registering temporary posts tenders, freelancer, permanent, everything is there. The interface is a bit clunky, but it has lots of really good, good content. Obviously, Museums Association website, we'll also have jobs. But other than that, my, my approach would be is identify the organisations you want to work with, follow them on social media accounts, visit their websites, but also tell everybody you want to work in a particular institution or a particular, particular role and get them to do uh, your hard work for you. You know, often people send me jobs and I'm like, oh, I haven't thought about that or I might have missed that if they haven't so use your network to help you. Thank you so any places you think Natalia where should people be looking what are the best sites for the actual job search and internships and um, graduate roles? I just mirror what Tamsin said and I think it was I mean I was thinking this in terms of the last question as well and in terms of this entry-level position I think consider thinking more about the organizations that you want to work with and, and find opportunities in them um, I mean, for example, through our internship programme, people have gone on to do programming at Alchemy and Atlas and all these really interesting arts organisations coming in at a very particular entry level position, which is much more general. Um, so I think Tamsin is right. Find the organisations that are interesting to you and just be in touch with them. Um, and that's certainly how our internship programme works. So if anybody is interested, feel free to get in touch with us at Devron Projects. Um, Creative Scotland Opportunities uh, Desk is also a really uh, great resource for people. Um, so I would have a wee look on there as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Natalia. And it comes to Karen to <laughs> dig deep into her brain to think of something that nobody else has said. <laughs> uh, well, anything to add, Karen? I think I could suggest there's a website, Museum Jobs UK, if you want to work in the UK, and you can search geographically as well, which is also useful for me as I mentioned of going anywhere other than Scotland. Um, I think LinkedIn is becoming increasingly useful. So the bigger my network gets on there, the more aware I become of things. And I have had um, approaches from students wanting to, to link to me, which I assume is so that they will keep abreast of what's happening in terms of jobs at the museum. And uh, Natalia mentioned Creative Scotland and Tamsin also mentioned the previous um, 
question the, the the sort of role of project so these project jobs that come up which I think are really good entry-level um, jobs uh, even you know especially if, if you're looking for a curatorial post so look at where the funding is going keep an eye on the big funders um, in the sector like Museums Gallery Scotland and um, National Heritage Lottery Fund or whatever it's called now and you know who are they giving money to and uh, what, what are they doing with that sometimes I learn about projects where a post hasn't been advertised because it's um, for I well I don't know for what reason but I know about the project because I've seen it through the funder themselves. Brilliant and there's one last thing I would suggest and that is keeping in touch with our alumni of which we have two lovely alumni here today uh, Karen and Natalia and if you want to connect with um, our alumni if you go to the career service website you'll see um, Glasgow Careers Alumni Network and you can sign up to that and you can see all of our alumni who have volunteered to be there as a point of contact so definitely use that because it'll allow you access to people that you might not otherwise have had easy access to. So I would definitely suggest you do that too. Okay, now a couple of questions here, which I'm going to again put together because they're both about postgrad qualifications. So how useful are postgrad qualifications like museum studies? What jobs do they open up? And are there any postgrad degrees you recommend in particular? Karen? Right. Um, I, when I went to do my master's at Glasgow, I already had an undergraduate degree, a master's degree and a PhD. So I wasn't doing it for the qualification. I was doing it for the subject and the, um, I guess, the professional skills as well, because I hadn't worked in museums before. And it was not only incredibly um, useful and interesting. Um, it was also just such a, a privilege to be back studying for a year. I enjoyed it enormously. I enjoyed meeting all the other people who were on the course. And I actually really feel for students this year that they haven't had some of those opportunities. So yes, um, they are definitely useful. I think the um, MSC IMP and the Museum Studies course at Glasgow University are excellent examples. The Leicester University um, has a good reputation for museum, uh, as does St Andrews in Scotland and Dundee University for, for archives as well, I think would be the ones I'd be looking at. Thank you, Karen Tamsin. Um, so I think it's really important to say that having a master's won't necessarily get you the job, but what it might do is get you shortlisted. So lots of masters tend to be far more theoretical than practical. And as a recruiting manager, what I'll be looking is to get somebody that can hit that ground running. So having that, both of those aspects is really important, which is why if you have got an opportunity to do a work placement as part of your master's, more difficult at the moment, or if you do do volunteering as well, that really is the, the positive thing. I also think sometimes doing a master's once you're already in the sector, actually, I know that sounds bizarre, enables you to really grow and use that master's really, really well. Um, other thing I would just highlight is that we publish a course guide every year. It's coming out week commencing the 1st of March. And that has a whole raft of different courses. But if you are interested in a course, put a call out on Twitter or on any other social media platform and hear from the people that have actually done it rather than just looking at the employability scores or what the university says their course does. Because, of course, they're always going to present that positively. Good advice. OK, there was one last question. And I, I think I'm going to come to you for this one, Natalia. So the question is, would you say that the promotional strategies of museums, so can I just substitute in there cultural institutions, museums, and because obviously that's what you represent, Natalia. So would you say that the promotional strategies of museums and cultural institutions have changed because of COVID? What are the new ways of promoting digital materials to get those high levels of engagement? I don't know if I'm the best person to ask. Um, I mean, we are, we, we have digital content, but we, um, I mean, there's two things. Our, we have got a big focus on a local audience. Um, so for example, um, we run a weekly uh, Friday lunch, which used to be in our kitchen, which was literally inviting a local community to come and cook and talk about an interesting subject. We do a similar thing. Um, monthly for an, an event called Food Chain where we invite someone from the community from 
um, a particular background to cook uh, a meal of their heritage and to share that with, with other people. We've adapted and we've brought these events online and it has been interesting because all of a sudden, you know, we're able to, to, to connect with a much broader audience. Um, for us, I guess that audience is coming from, um, is coming from a network that, that exists in our creative programming. So we, both through my old organization and at Devon Projects, we are, um, we have, you know, international, um, an international artist network that is a big part of the way that we work here. Um, so yeah, I guess it's, it's an opportunity for us to bring our networks together by adapting existing events into a digital realm. But for us, it really is an adaption. <laughs> um, I mean, we, it's incredibly important for us to think about hospitality. Um, and when we're thinking about international partnerships, I think there is, and again, this is coming from a very a particular social and political um, and cultural ethos, but there is a bit of a, a caution in our team to, to kind of, to commit too much to digital working as um, a new way of working, um, especially when we've already been dealing with barriers in terms of freedom of movement um, around the world. So we, we won't be discouraging physical international working. And I think it's important for our community here, um, but there is a really interesting opportunity just now for us to um, invite our international audience into um, a very local context with, with these kind of community focused events. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly with that, that there's, there's lots we can learn, but there's lots we don't want to lose either. And the, the human connection, and I've been hearing that across all the conversations today, this one and the last one, music, like everybody's just missing being in a space and touching things and seeing people, yeah. So thank you very, very much, Tamsin. Thank you very, very much, Natalia. Thank you very, very much, Karen. That was a fantastic discussion, and I'm really glad I've recorded it because there's so much good stuff here that I'm going to circulate to all the students that didn't make it today. So thank you very, very much. Um, can I just ask you to maybe give one last word on the subject, um, whatever piece of advice you think might be useful uh, for the students as a takeaway. So can I come to you first, Karen? Oh gosh. Um, I would say that um, I think persistence um, pays off and just don't be afraid to pester people. I've used that strategy th throughout my life and it's paid off quite, quite well. So don't, you know, hide your light under a bushel. Thank you. Natalia? I think what Tamsin said earlier was really a lovely um, kind of sentiment about this, um, the vision of a long game. And, and she's so right. Like we have time. <laughs> and I think, yeah, I guess also think about um, what organisations and institutions are really active right now. I mean, of course, there has been a change, and um, but we've not furloughed um, staff necessarily, and we've still still producing a very busy programme safely. Um, and there'll be so many other organisations that are doing the same. So use the time to to to, to get to know organisations um, that are you know specific to your context and get in touch with them and have a chat because we're we're here we're open we're talking to people and you seem like a friendly enough bunch <laughs> <laughs> thank you Natalia Tamsin follow your values uh, we're only here once do work that you love with people that you love with collections that you love so follow your values Thank you very much. And on that lovely inspirational note, thank you very much, um, panelists, Tamsin, Natalia and Karen. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you students for coming and your questions. And up next is the little learning piece. If you're interested specifically in archives, it's called The Unusual Archivist, a one woman retrospective of her slightly different archives career. And that's coming from Jen Young, who is the assistant archivist at HarperCollins Publishers. So an interesting archival role. So once again, thanks and goodbye.